Giorno Milano. I'm sorry, I look like I might be Italian, but I don't actually speak any Italian at all, so uh, this will be in English. Um, thank you very much to Christiana for inviting me to uh, come and speak. Um, so my name is James Higgs. I'm a technology director at um, US2. US2 is a digital product studio um, based in London, um, Sweden, Malmo, uh, New York, and Sydney. Um, so we have four studios. We have actually it's more than 200 people now, and it's more than 22 nationalities now. So um, growing all the time. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I would like to use this bit to set up some expectations about what I'm going to say later so you don't think that I'm saying something different than I really am saying. So we make, we have three different business models that we run at the same time. Um, the first of those is that we make award-winning products and games. Um, the one you might have heard of um, is Monument Valley. It sold several million copies. Um, it won an Apple Design Award. It won um, a BAFTA, which you probably haven't heard of, but is like a British, really uh, small version of the. Well, it's not that small, but it's the it's the British version of the Oscars. Um, and there's a there's a games category, and we won one of those. So um, we are very into high quality products. That's the thing that I would like to to get across. The second thing that we do. Uh, sorry, that's I've already done that. The second thing we do is innovative client works. We do a lot of work for clients that you will have heard of. Um, for example, Sky. Um, the, uh, the, the screenshot there is for the um, famous department store, Harvey Nichols. Um, we're working with Jaguar Land Rover, uh, with Ford. They're big name clients. So um, it, our quality standards are very high. Um, so when I say quality is a variable and we go through this, you have to keep the fact that we produce this very high quality stuff in mind when I say it. I'm not saying produce stuff that isn't high quality. So I'm the technical, I'm one of the two technical technical directors in London and um, we have a team of uh, 35 or so um, developers spanning iOS, Android, web um, and uh, automated testing. Um, and we call ourselves product engineers, um, which can be a bit confusing because people think we're making, you know, physical things, which we don't. Um, but it's not just about software engineering. We're engineering products. Um, that's the crucial difference. Um, and so everything I say today will be about delivering end-user software. We also do some open source work, and a lot of what I say today is going to be applicable to that, but not all of it. So there are some significant differences between shipping, shipping open source software where your user is another programmer and sh shipping end user software where your user is not a, well, maybe a programmer but isn't doing a programming task when they're using the software. Um, and so as product engineers, um, we serve the needs of the user and also the business through the product. Um, so, uh, we are, at us too, um, a very, very user-centered practice. We do a lot of user research, we do a lot of user testing. Um, we use lean and agile methodologies in order to bring in as much learning as we can from, from our users. And so the focus is always, should always be on serving users. Um, and we do that through the product. And so you'll notice that I didn't say anything about code in that definition of what product engineers do. So code is not is a means to an end, not the purpose of what we do. Um, and so what we do is we do we make things um, we do things to make the product better. Um, that's our primary goal. We don't do things to make our lives as engineers better. Um, that's not the goal. Although it might be, it might be a means to an end. We make our engineering lives easier insofar as that helps the product. So we don't do things because it makes us make us feel proud of our code. We don't do things because it makes our code tidy. We do things because it serves the product. If it doesn't serve the product, we don't, we don't do it. So one of the biggest issues that I see today in our industry is over-engineering. Um, to put a bit of a context, um, the IBM presentation just now showed a typewriter. That's how I learned to type on a manual typewriter before 
um, com well, there were computers, but not many. Uh, I learned before the PC was was uh, launched, so I have a lot of experience of seeing software developed. And there was a time when pr when software was badly under engineered, um, and I think there's been um, a wonderful uh, process of making software a lot better. Um, and I think we're now we've gone too far. We've started prioritizing. Um, the quality of the code and the quality, the technical quality of things over the actual end goal. So engineering is, over engineering, sorry, is where you privilege guesses about the future over facts about the present. So what you know now is the only thing that matters when you're developing a product. Um, what you speculate may be truth in the future, you're almost certainly just guessing. There are some things you can know about the future, like you might know that there's a release date coming up, or there's a particular piece of promotional activity that you need to hit. So there are some facts. Um, we made an application for the World Cup, for example. That's going to happen whether our application is ready or not. So some facts about the future are relevant, but most are not. Um, and the other thing that over-engineering is, is where you make things that are sufficiently easy more complicated. Um, for example, in the clean code movement, you will see hundreds of classes. Um, it's very, very clean, um, but I find it incredibly difficult to understand. Um, you know, I saw a friend of mine tweeted about looking at some Java code for the first time for years and struggling to find where's the code that does anything. Um, also, you can make yourself your lives easier. The IBM presentation showed you a load of services that just work. I battle every day against people reinventing those services that already work to do them in a slightly worse way. Um, and with none of the edge cases covered ourselves because we like writing software. Um, so we're really into using things that work already and specializing the things that we need to for the product that we're making. Um, now this clean code thing also links into a movement called software craftsmanship. and. Um, I do not like this movement. <laughs> um, I apologize if you're somebody who does, but I'm going to try and convince you that, uh, that I'm right. So if we think about real craftsmanship in the real world, I'm sorry about the gendered nature of the word craftsman. I'm going to come to that on this slide. Um, when a potter makes a pot, she touches it with her hands. And the thing that you buy is the same thing, physical thing that she touched. So her craftsmanship, craftswomanship, um, is vital to the production of that piece of pottery. If her craftsmanship is poor, then it will be a poor pot. If her, if her craftsmanship is great, it will be a great pot. And there's very little in between, in between you and the craftsman. But users don't care how your code is structured. And that's because they never see or touch your code. And that's because your code is a transitional artifact. Um, so when your code executes on a device, it's gone through a compiler, maybe, or it's gone through an interpreter, um, or it's on a browser. The user doesn't know anything about how that came, those pixels came to be on their screen. All they care about is that those pixels are on the screen in the right place, and that when they tap on things or they click on things, the expected thing happens. And so I think a lot of programmers that I come into contact with and that I see tweeting and I see blog posts from focus on the code as though that is the product. But it's not. It's a step on the, direct, on the way, on the journey to the product. So I'm now going to go into a bit of a, another real-world example. This is um, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who everybody knows it's one of the greatest musicians, artists of all time. And in 1788, he wrote his Symphony Number no. 40 in G minor, which is Kirkwell 550 if you're a music geek. Um, and that's a very famous symphony. I'm not going to sing it for you because it would be really embarrassing, but you will have heard it. And we're not certain it was ever performed. Some academics are not certain if it was ever performed in his lifetime. Um, but the modern thinking is that it almost certainly was, because there are two versions of it. Uh, the first version um, is scored for, the woodwind is scored for oboes, flutes, and bassoons. 
and the second version adds clarinets. And the reason for that is that, almost certainly, the reason is that on the second performance, or the second version when it was performed, there were clarinetists available. And the first time, there weren't clarinetists available. And so Mozart changed this piece of music, which is an absolute masterpiece, because presumably, the, presumably he would have preferred to have clarinets available. Um, and when they weren't for the first performance, he removed them. So this is a highly pragmatic um, approach to getting his music performed, which is the thing that mattered to him. Um, the, the notion that art is somehow sanctified, the artist is sanctified, is a romantic notion from much later than, well, several decades later than Mozart. At Mozart's time, um, you were just expected to produce music and play it as much as possible. He, in fact, in his last, the last year of his life, um, three years after he composed that symphony, uh, he wrote some music on a commission for the glass harmonica, which is, uh, he would never have written that if somebody hadn't asked him to do it, but he needed the money. So he did something that was pragmatic. Um, so our code is to our products what Mozart's manuscripts are to his music, to the performance of his music. Mozart's music only exists if it's played. It doesn't exist on paper. I mean, if you can read music by sight, you can play it in your head, but it's still, the music itself is the sound waves that go through the air or the imaginary ones in your head, not on the paper. So caring about your code as an end in itself is like Mozart worrying about his handwriting. Um, there's a myth that Mozart never made any mistakes when he was writing his music, but that's nonsense. If you look at some of his manuscripts, they're covered in corrections and crossings out and so on. Um, and... Uh, he, that, he just sent it to a copyist and they made it into a fair copy and then it got printed. So nobody ever plays music from Mozart's manuscripts. Um, so moving back to some technical topics uh, of that uh, analogy, um, I, uh, I quickly Googled why do refactoring? Um, because refactoring is something that people love to do. We've got to refactor this. Um, and the reason is... Um, you, um, you, because you have to do it right. I, I can't see this, the text on my screen and I don't have it in my memory, so I'm going to move away a bit. Um, so this is a blog post by a guy called Chris Ergel. I don't know him. I'm sorry to pick on him, but it's the first result that came up in Google. I'm a huge proponent of writing quality code, a view that's shared by many of my colleagues. Unfortunately, I do encounter those who do not share my enthusiasm. Their view is often one of get it done, whereas I like the position of get it done right. And his re the reasons for doing it right are because your code sucks. <laughs> uh, debts accrue interest. He's talking about technical debt, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, repetition is dangerous. Um, spaghetti, haha, <laughs> relevant to today. Spaghetti is good to eat, I can confirm that, um, but bad to read. He's talking about spaghetti code. I don't know if you use that analogy in Italy, but we do in um, the English-speaking world. And littering is rude. But none of these things mention the user of the software. They're all things about the code itself. They don't say what the impact on the user is of any of these things. There might be some, but it doesn't tell you what they are. So he says that these things are good because the code ends up in a state that he prefers. So I think if you leave here with one message from me, um, I would like it to be that there is no right way a priori. Uh, there are right ways, m often multiple right ways to do something, um, but there is no one right way in advance without thinking about the particular context that you're in. Um, so I would like to suggest, in fact, that there are only two things that matter to a product engineer, and those are correctness, by which I mean the features work as they're supposed to, it performs adequately, and um, it is secure because users hate badly performing software. They hate user, um, using software that doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And they hate software that's insecure or they will hate it as soon as they find out it's insecure. On the other side, you have reasonable medium term productivity. So users like new features um, and you need to ship those at a cadence that's c comfortable for the user. So these, these are two sides of the same coin. This is the trade-off you have to make every day when you're making software. Um, getting it to do exactly what it's supposed to do, um, but being able to add further features or tweak those features as you go forward. Um, and so the, all the other things that you think about 
um, are means to those ends. They're, they're to make you more productive in the medium term, um, by which I mean a few weeks or months in the future, certainly not any more than that. I'd prefer weeks to months, um, and to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. And you know, let's be honest, all software ships with bugs. Um, the space shuttle flew with about 900 known issues. Um, and people are going to die if those known issues turn out to be worse than they thought. And that's what happened. You should read about Challenger, actually. It's a very interesting case study. Um, so I'd like to talk about TextMate. TextMate, who here used to use TextMate? One person. Great. <laughs> so nobody uses Macs here or just hasn't been programming for very long. Um, so TextMate was the predominant code editor for OS X for years. Um, I mean, everybody in the office I worked in then used TextMate. Um, and then they announced, I think it was 2008, I'm guessing, I think it was something like that, they announced a rewrite because uh, it wasn't, there were some technical problems with it and they were going to rewrite it from the ground up and it was going to be absolutely brilliant and so on. And now Sublime Text is the predominant code editor on OS X because they never shipped TextMate 2. Um, and so the technically superior TextMate 2 is in fact an infinitely worse product than TextMate 1 because nobody uses it. There's another great case study about Netscape uh, between versions 4 and 6 as well when they rewrote it. Uh, they never shipped version 5 but they kept the version number but that's another, it's an almost, almost identical story. So unreleased code is an investment that can't pay off. It's, unreleased code's worthless. And so that's what lean advocates called inventory. So in the, the, the analogy they're using, that's like a factory storing um, things to use to make products. And inventory is a problem in manufacturing because it costs money to keep it there because you have to, you know, you have to pay for the warehouse and things, things go off and break and you have to invest money in buying them, which you then cannot get back because you haven't turned them into something that people will pay for yet. So lean manufacturing aims to keep inventory as low as possible. And the same should be true of software. Um, so the goal should be to ship your code as soon as you possibly can. Um, and you know that might take you a while, but it might still be the quickest that you can possibly do it. Because um, otherwise, people are not going to use it. And so that means doing the simplest thing that could possibly work. And this is one of the tenets of, well, not, it's not one of the official tenets of Agile, but it's something you hear a lot at the, um, from Agile advocates um, because Agile is all about doing things simply and quickly and doing them again. Um, and so um, just to come back to the plague of over-engineering, I think that we've established that the thing that matters is the code that, or sorry, the product that users use on their device. And so that means that software engineers' own estimation of quality is meaningless. It doesn't matter whether software engineers like the quality of the code or not. It matters whether users like the product and use it. Um, and so while it's useful to evaluate your code for other reasons, to say, ah, this is great, we have quality code, and sit back in it with a satisfied expression on your face, that's not going to help anybody. And so here is the, my, uh, my guideline, my uh, um, recommendation for how you should try, what the, 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 the productivity you should try to hit. And that is, you need quality, which allows you to ship useful features, obviously, which work, at a cadence that works for the user. And so two brilliant examples. This morning, um, I've been to Milan a few times before, but I've never been to this Polytechnic before, so I used CityMapper to get here. And I don't know if you use CityMapper, but it's absolutely fantastic product if you don't know the place you're going. And CityMapper ship an update pretty much every two weeks, and there's new features all the time. And that is a brilliant experience for users. They add new cities all the time, they add new features, they add, you know, now you can uh, book an Uber from it. I don't know if you're Uber fans. Um, I'm not, but you can, if you are, you can book a, an Uber from it. You can um, track whether the rental bikes in London um, are available, all that kind of stuff. Um, and they do that. They, there's an incredibly quick release cadence. Another product that does this is Slack. Um, 
So I don't know if you use Slack, but it's an, another awesome product. And um, they ship updates unbelievably regularly to, I mean, to the apps on the App Store, on the website, they're probably shipping them without you even knowing them. Um, and they're adding features all the time. They're responding to user feedback. They're changing things back when, you, when they change something and a new feature, people don't like it, they take it out again. Um, or they iterate on it to make it something that does work. They're incredibly responsive products and people absolutely love them because, they, because they're so responsive. So if the quality is too high, if you're spending too much time trying to polish your code, then the cadence will be too slow and you'll be unable to ship quickly. That's what happened to TextMate. It's also because they tried to rewrite it from scratch, which is, um, well, very often a big mistake. If the quality is too low, though, eventually it's going to be impossible to add new features and you're going to come grinding to a halt. So it's not that I'm saying aim for low quality, I'm saying aim for an appropriate level of quality. And so we, I mentioned refactoring earlier. Refactoring is what we do when adding a feature is harder than it needs to be. Um, and I'm sure there are some other reasons as well, but um, for me that's really the only one um, that that uh, that I've seen that is really that sensible. Um, and we refactor solely because there is value to the user or to the business in doing so. That's the only reason for doing it. The code will be cleaner, I keep hearing. Nope, doesn't, doesn't fly. The code will be easier to test. But if it's already meeting the quality standard of the user, then it doesn't need to be any easier to test. Um, there'll be less repetition in the code. So what? If there's repetition in the code and the users like the product, I don't care. So just to reiterate, we refactor solely because there is value to the user in doing so. Now, cleaner code might make a better product for users. Better tested code might make a better product for users and so on, but that's not why we do it. Um, and so we have come up with very elaborate solutions to things that are already sufficiently easy, but they're quite repetitive. And so people go to enormous lengths to reuse code between products, between projects, um, when really often you should just copy and paste it. Um, and if anyone's got into an absolute nightmare with a JavaScript package manager because they try to extract something and then, uh, you know, sometimes, I'm not saying always, I'm saying sometimes. Copy and paste is the best way to reuse code, even within the same application actually. So all software engineering techniques are a means to an end. They're not a moral imperative. They're not uh, a religion. They are, they're there to serve a purpose. And so I alluded to it earlier. Let's now talk about the obvious objection to this philosophy, which is technical debt. Now, technical debt is where you do something in a way that you think will need improvement in the future, but which does work now. So you do something and you've got it working, but you're not happy with the solution from a code point of view. You are happy with the solution from a it works point of view. And when I say it works, every time I say that, I mean it works as specified, it performs, and it is secure. Um, in England, people often say those are non-functional requirements, which I find very puzzling because security and performance are features, uh, which matter very greatly to users. So that's what technical debt is. But debt is not bad. I have a mortgage. Um, I'm one of the lucky people who own a house in London. Um, people um, who are joining the profession find it almost impossible to buy a house in London. Now, taking that debt on was a responsible decision um, because I can pay it back and because my house is worth more than the loan. So that's a responsible responsible. Um, debt decision. Um, when you look at uh, payday loans, I don't know if you have that sort of um, company here, but we have a load of them in, in England where you can get a loan against your paycheck. That's a responsible uh, debt. So, like, you know, use debt responsibly. Um, and so, core to the agile philosophy, as I mentioned earlier, is the concept of iteration. And there's part of preparing for this talk, I looked up what does iterate mean. And the first definition in the Chambers English Dictionary is to do again. Um, and nearly all of the 
techniques that I'm talking about that I that I find um, to be over engineering are involve not doing it again. Um, and so people will go to extraordinary lengths to avoid doing something again. So we're going to have to come back to this. I hear people say on Teams, like, okay, that's cool. Um, let's ship this thing now, and if we need to, we'll come back to it later. If we don't need to come back to it later, then we won't. So I think it's a fundamental error to try and solve a problem definitively on the first try. I've tried this many, many times in my own career, tried to solve problems um, in a way that I think that's it, that problem's solved forever. The philosopher Wittgenstein wrote um, a book called Tractato Logico Philosophicus um, in 19... I don't know, just before the First World War anyway. Um, and he believed that he'd solved all of the problems of philosophy forever. And then he... Uh, his, his, his life is fascinating. Um, he went to fight in the war um, and he made he became a furniture designer and then eventually he realized that he hadn't solved all the problems of philosophy and he went back to work. Um, so even someone as brilliant as him can't solve problems on the first try. So don't, you know, we're not as brilliant as him, so let's not, let's not do that. Um, and the reason um, we shouldn't is not just because we're not brilliant enough to do it, it's but because we don't even know if a feature is worth having until the users have used it. We can do a lot of upfront testing to find out, do people want this? Do we think people want this? People say they want this and so on. And you can, there's lots of different techniques you can use to do this. And you can get a very r good sense of certainty that people want what you're making. But you will never know for certain until you launch it. Um, and so that is one of the main reasons why you shouldn't over-engineer. Get the feature in the hands of real users and find out if they like it. So it makes no sense to spend a lot of money getting something exactly right if you don't know if it's needed. In fact, that's a very, very frustrating experience when it happens to you. You spend, I've polished that. that that's a brilliant feature and no one wants it. Um, that's a very frustrating experience to have. It's far more exhilarating to have the experience of people loving it when you're slightly less than happy with the way that you made it. That's a much better experience. Um, and so this is why in Agile we use a limited time horizon so we work when we we sometimes use Kanban, but most often we use Scrum and we use two week sprints and we plan in two weeks ahead. That's it. Um, and beyond the two weeks, we're guessing. Ideally, you're shipping that code every two weeks. I mean, that's what you know. Working software is one of the key things about Agile, and so um, you you want to be at the end of the two weeks trying to ship that software. Maybe shipping doesn't mean literally to end users, it might mean to some internal test or something like that, but you want to produce working software at the end of every, at the ever, end of every iteration. Um, and if you're planning beyond that iteration, you are guessing. Um, and so I think that engineers have scared non-engineers with technical debt for too long. I hear it all the time, ooh, there's going to be some technical debt. and and then the non-engineers go, oh, oh, no, there's going to be technical debt. That sounds really bad. We mustn't have any technical debt. But th there isn't any, w any useful software anywhere in the world that couldn't be improved in some way in its code structure. So technical debt is not something to be avoided. It's something to be used responsibly, as I said earlier. So here's my challenge if you're objecting to technical debt and is to quantify it. So explain to people... What is, the, what is the problem with that debt? Um, is it something that we really need to avoid right now? Like my grandfather, talking about mortgages, my grandfather uh, hated debt. Uh, he thought it was, he thought, actually thought it was immoral to have debt. And he never had any debt in his life and he didn't own a house. And so he paid many, 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 many times the value of the house in rent. That he lived, they lived in the same house for 45 years, my grandparents. Um, and that's a very poor decision <laughs> about debt. So quantify whether that debt is a problem now. When's it going to become a problem? When are we going to have to pay it down? Um, and so many engineers will assert that a given approach is better but fail to explain how in terms that matter to the product in the foreseeable future. So that's what you've got to do. If you're saying that um, technical debt is a problem, you've got to explain why that's a problem for the product, meaning for users, in the foreseeable future. If you can't do that, then you should just, do, you should just take the debt on. And most of the time, um, we're told, 
that there are going to be dire consequences later if we don't do it the right way. Um, but are you certain that the future change will need to be made? You say that, oh, we're going to have to come back to this, but how do you even know that at the time you're saying it? Um, as I said, the users may not even want the feature. We may have to make radical changes to the feature. There may be some new feature of iOS that comes out, let's say, if you're writing an iPhone app, that means that your feature is no longer relevant, or you could adapt it um, in a way that means you have to rewrite it from scratch anyway. So you, you, you think you know that you have to return to the code, but you don't. Um, and so, yeah, that result, that presupposes some precise knowledge about the future that we don't yet have. I mentioned some things we do know, like we know that the World Cup is going to, well, it's the Olympics now, is the next big sporting event. We know the Olympics will happen in Rio uh, next year, and if you're writing some software that's going to be used alongside the Olympics, then obviously you know some facts about the future. But, um, you know, most of the things that we say we know, we don't really know. So, never mind technical debt, let's talk about technical bets. So engineers who want to invest in doing things the right way should show where the value is to the user. We've already talked about that. When you choose to make a technical bet, which is something you're saying, I know something about the future, I'm betting that this, this is true about the future. Um, what you should do is go back and measure whether it was worth it when you've had some context. So the thing that you said was going to become true about the world, did it become true about the world? And even then, was it worth making at that point? Could you have, could you have got the, the feature in the hands of users faster and still ended up where you are today? And don't, there's a, there's a two brilliant pages that I love on, on English language Wikipedia. The first one is called A List of Common Misconceptions. Um, one of the common mis misconceptions, I don't know if, it's, if, the, if people think it's true here, but they th said that Roman amphitheaters had things called vomitoriums where you'd go and be sick if you'd eaten too much. But actually, it, the, it's just the word vomitorium uh, in Latin means where people exit the, the, uh, the Colosseum or whatever it is. So there's a list of those. That's a brilliant page. Um, the other one is a list of fallacy, common fallacies. And a common fallacy is retrospective determinism, which is where you look back at a decision made in the past and say that it was inevitable you'd ended up where you are. So I think a good example is when he declared himself dictator of the Roman Republic, Julius Caesar was bound to be assassinated, and that's obviously false. Um, so it's very tempting to look back and say, ah, I told you that that was going to happen. But how often do you look back and at ones you said, I told you that, and you were wrong? You only look back at the ones that you were right on. And they're probably far fewer than the ones that you were wrong on. So you may look back and think you should have made the bet. But then by that logic, you should have played last week's lottery. But you didn't have the facts about what numbers were going to come, come out. And so in fact, it's probably a, it's a 50, well in, in England, it's a 14 million to one bet to win the lottery. And it's a sure thing if you know what the numbers are. So like in one week's time, you'll know what the numbers are. And oh, I should have played the lottery. I told you. Um, and so consider, even if you would have won the bet, was it the right time to make the bet? Did you make a responsible bet? Even if you were right, you might not have made a responsible bet. So to break even on a technical bet, you must later save double the time it takes, at least double, um, to double the time it takes to make the bet. So we're going to make this, we're gonna, I'm going to do this the right way. So any time that the right way costs you beyond the simple, easy way, um, must then pay back double because you've used that time already. This is a concept from economics called opportunity cost. Um, and that's when you lose um, the right to exercise alternatives when you, when you choose a different one. So like, you can't spend the same euro twice. Um, you can't spend the same hour twice. Um, and so when, when you choose to make the technical bet, you are therefore possibly choosing between that bet and a feature now. So we're going to do this the right way. We're going to spend two days getting this absolutely right rather than the, let's say, half a day that it would take to do it quickly. So then you've cost a one and a half day feature now. That's, that's the bet you're making. So you're saying that the future state that you say is better is going to be worth more than shipping the feature now. And it's going to make you twice as productive in future. So you're going to save three days in future 
And so we, we know that users want this feature now. We've got our research, um, or we, no, we don't know. We, we have a very high confidence that users want the, this feature now. Let's say, so is your bet going to pay big enough to justify not shipping that feature now? So the thing I would encourage you um, to focus on is, n is not betting on making things that are already sufficiently easy easier. So like this is going to be difficult in future to change, but it, you know, it just means a bit of hassle. It means a couple of hours of copying something or editing something. That's OK. You know, w w it doesn't matter if we have to spend a couple of hours in the future tidying this up when we become certain that that's what we need to do. Um, so another thing that I see an awful lot is um, people altering code to reflect their own preferences. So if you're working on a team, you'll see people um, arguing about what coding style to have, like where should closing braces go? <sighs> so boring, how many tabs, how many spaces should tabs be? Um, should you use this class or that class to do con connectivity to the internet? There's loads of them. And what will often happen on a team is that people will disagree and then go and do it their own way. And then what will happen is that when they receive code from somebody else that they have to go and work on, they'll then convert it to their preferred way uh, because that makes them feel comfortable. Um, that's a really bad um, pathology in a team and you should work hard to respect the style of the project and the team as a whole. Don't go over things that already work um, just to satisfy your own cleanliness. Oh, I'm going to change all the braces to be on the same line as the function declaration and then someone else is going to change them back to be on the next line because that's what they like. It's a total waste of everybody's time and you're betraying your users if you're doing that. And then start ex eliminating everything that's external to the product um, until there's evidence it's needed. So documentation is a good example. I had a debate at work about whether we should document method declarations. And my view is that you almost never need to comment in your code unless you're doing something that is non-obvious. There's a reason I'm doing it this way, um, and uh, this is why. That's a good comment. The comments, the, the documentation I'm seeing is literally just copying and pasting the names of the parameters, the name of the method, and like they're well-named methods and parameters. If you're a developer, you should be able to figure those things out in about one second by looking at them. And the developer in question is going back and doing this to all code and taking hours and hours and hours to do it to save some developers one second. This is a total waste of time. And the defense I've heard is like, oh, well, you know, Apple do this. I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> Apple make us SDK, whose target is developers. We're making a product whose target is users, and they're never going to see this code. The only people who are ever going to see this code is us, and we already know how to read it. So and the documentation is not the only one. It's a very good example. But everything that's external to the product that isn't needed, if, the, if there needs to be evidence it's needed, if there isn't evidence it's needed, then get rid of it. So yesterday, as I was uh, fine-tuning this talk, um, my co-technical director retweeted this, which I think is, uh, I probably could have just put this slide up and not done the rest of the talk. But the, the critical question for any practice is, does it help us get better or more or faster feedback on whether the software is useful? I think that's an absolutely brilliant way of summarizing what I'm saying. Um, so test-driven development, behavior-driven development, um, you know, uh, um, inversion of control, dependency injection, yada, 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 all those techniques. The question is, does that help us get better feedback or not? But nothing else really matters. And it takes real discipline and thought to make the right trade-offs for a product. And that means empathizing with the users um, understanding the users. This is why I say product engineer, not software engineer. We're, we're trying to empathize as much as we can with how this product is going to be used. Um, and um, that means making trade-offs. And that means p potentially doing things that you are slightly uncomfortable with yourself. They don't match your standards for code or whatever, but that doesn't matter because you understand what the users want and you're going to try and you try everything to give them that. So one final analogy, I think that a, 
product of sufficient worth like um, City Mapper or Slack is like a great city. It's, um, it's never finished. It's constantly changing, always adapting to use. If you've ever been to London, you'll know that it's not, no one's designed London. Um, you know, partly it's because a lot of it burned down in 1666. Um, so it was used to be shaped a completely different way. Um, and now they constantly change it. Trafalgar Square used to be something you could drive through in a car. Now it's completely pedestrianized. One-way systems get created and removed. Buildings, every, almost every block in the city of London has a building that's been demolished and then rebuilt some, some other way. Um, a building that my office used to be in was, was demolished and rebuilt in almost exactly the same way, in fact. Um, and so this is how products are. You're constantly working on them. They're never finished. Um, you're always trying to improve them. Um, and so that's, a, you know, a, a city is an ultimate pragmatic thing. It's just, you know, it's never perfect. There are loads of frustrations. There are loads of reasons why it's a pain getting around a city like London. Um, but it works. So ask, so just to summarize, ask yourself and your team, are we over-prioritizing the future rather than the present? Think more about the present, the immediate future, rather than the long-term future. And keep things simple, move as quickly as you can, and don't be afraid to go over things again. That's the crucial thing. Don't be afraid to go over things again. People are desperate to avoid doing something again, but it doesn't really matter. It's fine. Um, so that's my talk. Thank you very much.